Okay, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone to our YMWREA September luncheon. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Laura Jackson, chairman of YMWREA for 2020 and a senior managing director at FTI Consulting's real estate group. Uh, I hope you all had a wonderful summer and are ready to enjoy our fall programming. Uh, to begin today's luncheon, I would like to introduce Leslie Harwood of Newmark, uh, our chair, also our chairman from 1992 to give today's invocation. Please welcome Leslie. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Laura. Thank you to the board. And uh, thank you, Sandeep, for being here. Uh, today is the first day after Labor Day, a day that usually signals children going back to school, packing up the beach blankets and forging ahead into cooler weather and hunkering back to work for a new year. But today is a different time and a different day. I want to welcome everyone back to YMWREA and, of course, to Sandeep for speaking today, as I just said. I've been listening to a lot of invocations of our past YMWREA events for inspiration. What to say today, given the current state of our city, our country, and our world? Every one of these invocations starts or ends with, how lucky are we to be in the greatest city in the world, New York City? Well, our city's hurting today. Many have left the city for safer grounds. Many have counted our city out before, but I for one love New York City and know many of you feel the same. It's hard to imagine that many of us are not back in the city and are thinking of not coming back for a while. We all need to make choices that are best for our families and for ourselves. But I want to applaud all of you for your resiliency. New Yorkers have handled a worldwide pandemic, living arrangements and working remotely bravely and successfully. So now is the time that our city needs us to come back and support it like it supported us during our lifetimes. Our people are hurting. We need to buy that ice cream, that amazing piece of pizza, and support your dry cleaner, and of course, our favorite restaurants. Our city needs our economic dollars. Change is upon us. With Laura Jackson, a powerful woman chairman as our leader, we are committed to making a difference. I ask all of you to dig deep and, com and commit to change, changing your own companies and framework to reflect what so many people are fighting for. We are at a moment where women have stood up and said enough sexual harassment in the workplace. We are at a moment where people of color have stood up and taken to the streets demanding public and basic human rights. We are an industry that needs to commit to change by changing what we look like and providing more opportunities for people who look different from us. This is not political, this is human. We have all been forced to go deep within ourselves and see what is important and what is possible. But now is the time we can make a difference, a difference in ourselves, our community, our companies, and in this organization. This is our time. Bless all of us for coming together, and may this be a time for healing, comfort, and inspiration. Amen. Aw, oh, thank you so much, Leslie. That was a very powerful message. Appreciate that. Okay, next up, we would like to recognize the former chairman in attendance today. So I will read them off, read off the names, and if you're a former chairman, stand up and imagine a stadium full of applause for you. David Burley, Kate Coburn, Andrew Roos, Leslie Harwood, Nikki Hurriet, Dave Coppell, Mark Lazon, Brian Waterman, Greg Shanker, David Browse, Bill Montana, Rob Fink, Brandel Radovitsky, David Burke, Jonathan Tutel, Lindsay <coughs> Ornstein, and Lenny Lazzarino. Next up, we would like to introduce our new 2020 spring new member class. This is a great group of professionals and we hope you will reach out and congratulate each of them on their membership in YMWREA. Some of you may have noticed our governor Alex Caskell has been introducing the new members on our Instagram. If you missed it, you can go follow us at YMWREA underscore NYC. Now to Lauren Calandrello, our membership chair. Hi everyone. It's certainly been a crazy six months to say the least. I'm so proud and impressed with the spring 2020 new members and their commitment to being involved and their dedication to YMWREA during these trying times. Please join me in congratulate, congratulating the following. Alice. Alice Fair, CBRE. Dave. 
Dave Carswell, Largo Real Estate Advisors. Sydney. Sydney Coles, Boston Properties. Mitch. Mitch Heifetz, Newmark. Max. Max Copella, Copella Rosen. Tyler. Tyler King, Newmark. Alex. Alex Leopold, Newmark. Walter. Walt Rooney, Boston Properties. Scott. Scott Tammy, URS Capital. Jess. Jessica Verdi, Colliers. Thank you, everyone, and congratulations again. We're excited to have you aboard. Thanks, Lauren, and congrats to all the new members. Uh, and now James Nelson will give us a quick update on the mentoring program. James? Welcome again to all of our new mentors uh, and our new members. Uh, we did have a successful summer where we did have three events where we have mentored uh, close to 20 candidates and that mentoring will continue, except this time we're going to open this up to all of you. So a week from today, on Tuesday, September 15th at noon, we are going to have a panel on commercial leasing fundamentals, and we are going to have our own Lindsay Orenstein, Gary Curry, and Melissa browse rakoff as the panelists, and it's going to be moderated by Pierre DeBoss from Romer DeBoss, who also has a continuing education program. So this will be accredited. So those of you who are brokers, um, by attending next week, you will uh, receive continuing education credit as well. But again, it's um, open to all of you. So hope uh, to see you then. Again, that's a week from today and you should have seen the RSVP uh, in your inboxes. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, Alan Bernstein is gonna give us an update on our website, Alan. Thanks, Laura. I know many of us are looking for ways to interact with friends and colleagues in the real estate industry right now, both in person and virtually. So to help our members do just that, on our website, we'll shortly be rolling out a community events page. Here you'll be able to submit social and informative events that you are hosting or involved with, and these will be posted on the website for our entire membership to view and join. We hope this feature allows our members to be more connected with each other and our community. As this feature gets rolled out over the next month or so, if you have any questions, just reach out to me directly. Thanks. I look forward to seeing you at one of these community events soon. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for all your hard work on the website. Uh, okay, let's go to Vice Chair Caroline Merck uh, for an update on our upcoming scheduled events. Hey, Laura. Um, thank you. I'm very excited to uh, unroll some really great programming this fall uh, for our members and applicants. Um, one event coming up that I want everyone to be on the lookout for for our email um, in order to RSVP is our first ever New York City cleanup event. This will be on Saturday, October 3rd at 11 a.m. We'll be meeting in Midtown with a small socially distanced group uh, and we'll um, have a designated route in Midtown to help clean up the city um, and give back, which very excited to have a, a nice in-person event coming up soon. Um, some additional events uh, to keep an eye out for. Uh, again, we'll keep emailing um, all the information as we usually do. We're gonna be doing a series of small uh, group Zoom networking events uh, to continue to keep our community very tight knit um, and you know, get everyone uh, back engaged again. Additionally, we'll be having an online poker tournament that will be raising money for charity. This will be hosted by our new member class. So very excited to unroll that. Um, we'll also continue to do our workout event series, both virtually and um, some outdoor in-person ones. Um, and we're also gonna be planning a local hiking event, um, as well as a very special uh, arts and culture event with the Museum of Jewish Heritage. So just keep an eye out on your emails and look forward to seeing everyone soon. Thanks. Thanks, Caroline. Looking forward to those events and getting back to some in-person things would be great. Uh, lastly, before we uh, have our speaker, I wanted to remind everyone about our YMWRA Diversity Committee that was formed in 2019. Uh, this fall, representatives from the committee will be reaching out to members companies to continue the dialogue on diversity and encourage a diverse pipeline of membership for YMWRA. So reach out to the Diversity Committee or Rob Shapiro, who's leading that group, uh, if you'd like to help. And now, without further ado, to introduce uh, a man that needs no introduction, Sandeep Mathrani. Um, he'll be uh, speaking and doing a Q&A, and so if you have any uh, questions you want to submit, you can submit them at the bottom of your screen through the Q&A function in your Zoom. 
Uh, Sandeep Mithrani was appointed CEO of WeWork uh, in February 2020, um, right before uh, a very interesting time for, for all of us. So interesting time to take over a new role and uh, such a big role. Uh, prior to WeWork, he started his career at Forest City, followed by leading retail acquisitions at Vernado Realty Trust. Uh, he left Vernado to be the CEO of GGP and ultimately recapitalized GGP, leading to his role as CEO of the retail group at Brookfield Properties. Quite an impressive resume. Uh, please join me in welcoming Sandeep. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I'm going to enjoy the next half an hour of you grilling me. <laughs> well, I'm glad it's gone both ways because when I started my career at Vernado, we, uh, we were always on conference calls and you were always like the voice and the uh, speaker in the sky in the conference room leading all these retail deals. So uh, it's good to see you could go uh, the other way now. I'm all for it. <laughs> So as the news broke that you were taking over uh, for at, as the CEO of WeWork, multiple people said to me, if anyone can figure this out, Sandeep can. So having already proven yourself uh, through your career at Vernado and GGP, what motivated you to take on this role at WeWork? Stupidity, <laughs> naivety, immaturity. <laughs> um, you know, but in all seriousness, you know, when I sort of uh, finished my career at uh, so selling GGP to Brookfield and then ending my career on Jan 31st of this year, I wasn't really expecting to get back into doing another turnaround anytime soon. Uh, but when this opportunity came, uh, there were really four reasons that I felt strongly uh, that I should, uh, should take it on. Uh, one was we work as a verb, and, you know, in a 10 year period, of span, in a time period, if you think about flexible office space, flexible space, the first name that comes to you is WeWork, right? So it's established itself as being, uh, you know, a, a verb. Second is not that many companies have a very good balance sheet. Uh, you know, I don't know that many real estate companies that are sitting with $4.1 billion of cash as, as of the end of the second quarter. Um, and so uh, I remember taking over GGP you know, the stock was 37 cents a share, market cap was $370 million, and we had $22 billion of debt, right? This is a little different situation. We have $750 million of bonds, uh, we have $4 billion of cash. So it actually had, you know, enough cash, and I felt it gave me enough of a runway uh, to, to get the company back on its feet. Third was, uh, it became a, you know, I use the word, you know, they, they do things that any um, real estate company or any company, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, you know, in a turnaround, hopefully has these two elements that you can correct uh, and, and effectively able to get it back on its feet. And one is usually a bloated SGNA, uh, having seen that now multiple times. Uh, and two is right sizing the, you know, the, uh, the real estate portfolio. And there's nothing new about that. I mean, in every company is an 80 20 rule. 80% of the assets are great, 20% are not so great. Uh, at GGP, we had the luxury of spinning out a company of, of its lower quality assets called Rouse. We did that spin in 2012, I took over in 2010. So nothing's shocking. And over the next you know, eight years, I think I sold another 100 assets. And so, uh, it, you know, so same thing here. I figured if we could right size uh, the, the, uh, the organization from a real estate perspective, uh, and we could right size the expense structure, we'd be in good shape. Um, again, you know, in the last 180 days since I've been CEO, uh, we've been able to right size the organization. Uh, we've got our expense structure completely uh, in control, and now truly it's a revenue growth. So for a long period of time, we had a revenue growth that was pretty astronomical, but we had expenses that far exceeded our, our revenue growth. And now that our, our expense structure is very streamlined, uh, it's about revenue growth. So, so the good news is, you know, step one, which is right size the organization and make sure our expense structure is correct, is complete. Um, and now it's really working to right size the real estate portfolio, uh, which we are doing in a very friendly manner with, with most landlords, I would say. Got it, interesting. So. It sounds like now you have a very uh, organized, complete plan of, of what to do. When you, when you started back in February, uh, before COVID, before any of this hit, did you have a very clear plan when you walked in on day one? I had a very clear plan. 
there was there was no difference. I mean, I had I had the opportunity for a few weeks to study the business. Uh, I, I knew the business model made sense, um, and you know it does make sense when you buy wholesale, sell retail. You start buying retail and sell luxury it doesn't make sense. Uh, but overall, the business model made sense, and at least what we like to call in-house WeWork 1.0, which was right sizing the organization from an expense structure and you know, making sure we have the right real estate portfolio. Uh, even pre coming here, uh, you know, I, I, I knew that we had to cut our expenses by half uh, and I didn't know how many assets wouldn't make any sense, but I did realize that it would have to be the 80-20 rule. There'd be no surprises there, there were no surprises. So that we call WeWork 1.0 what I didn't know, what, what is WeWork 1.5 and what is WeWork 2.0, which I know now, more now than I did then. Okay. So what did anything, I guess, surprise you and, and lead you to go to 1.5, 2.0? How, how did you pivot that plan? A couple of things. You know, I, I like to sit back and say one of the few things that are surprising to me is actually how resilient the business is, the business model is, right? Because one of the few things people always said, what happens in a recession to the business? Now, I don't think any of us expected that we'd be in a pandemic for six months. I don't think any business planned for a six month pandemic. And to be sitting here six months later, uh, you know, feeling, you know, I would say uh, that the business has resiliency uh, makes me feel very good. So that was one surprise. Um, and, 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 and to take it further, you know, the business started in 2010 with mainly small businesses. It was really a, a, you know, a place for startups to come to. Uh, and then in 2017, it sort of pivoted to more enterprise tenants. And today, 51% of our revenue is the you know, S&P 500 companies. And actually 65% of our leasing activity through the pandemic is all enterprise tenants. So we felt that there was resiliency in the business model. As a matter of fact, for, for good news purposes, you know, August sales, even for small businesses sort of rebound, we're about 60% of where we were in February. Uh, so we feel pretty good. And July leasing activity was the same as February pre-COVID. So if those are leading indicators, then we start to feel better about the business. And then we sort of sat back and said, you know, you sort of pivot and you start to think uh, about what we work 1.5 could be You have all these different ideas and thoughts. Um, and let me not take away from the fact that I came in here saying this is a real estate company. But I also said, is there a way to digitize our real estate? Uh, and every industry has digitized their business. You know, the, you know if you think about, uh, you know, the, uh, the, from, a, from a real estate perspective, the, uh, the, the residential business is really digitized to a large extent. It's made, you know, if you want to rent an apartment related or Avalon Bay, it's a very simple, straightforward process and they've come a long way to digitize the real estate. So I don't mean by digitizing the real estate as to become a digital company, but how do you digitize your real estate? And what we didn't realize is that, that you know, we, we, we have this all access product, uh, never marketed it. Uh, and it was really built, I think, more for the employees of the company. We have a black card we carry and we have access to all 800 locations around the world, which I think is a Herculean feat, by the way, uh, because I remember at GGP, I couldn't get into three offices in three different cities with the carrying three different cards, right? Because it just wasn't able to do that. Here I can carry one card and I can open any door or enter any building on the world. And so we said, okay, what can we do with that product? And how is this really the future of this company? And that was a digitization of real estate. And so today, you know, we're able to offer it to institutions where you can, I'll give you 1,000 of these, but you only pay me for 300, right? And so effectively the logic there is the utilization will be about 33%. Um, and effectively, if the 301st person comes, one or two things happen. Either the company will say, reject that person, or secondly, they'll say, charge me on a per diem basis. Uh, and that's gotten a lot of legs uh, right now in this COVID environment where we're able to provide access to every member across all 800 locations globally. Uh, and if you're in New York, as an example, we have a WeWork location within a 15 minute walk of every white collar worker in Manhattan. So effectively, by being able to offer this, 
you know, you can actually get people to come if they need to get out of the house or they, they you know, they have disturbances or they don't have Wi-Fi, they don't have all the limitations. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of legs. On the contrary, we've probably sold over 100,000 of these memberships already over the last 30 days, and it's really not even been advertised. Um, and so the second is an on-demand product, which is essentially you can provide access to any of our locations that you were piloting it in New York City. You could book an, a conference room or an office by the hour, by the day, by the week. And so we're able to digitize sort of our real estate. And, and actually the, the pilot is going much better than we anticipated. And it's also interesting to see the kind of people that go to it who really need that reprieve. And please appreciate a lot of times people went to a, um, to a, you know, to a Starbucks or sit inside a Starbucks, you know, and I sort of joke in house and I said, you know, Starbucks, you bought the coffee, got the space for free. And we work, you know, you get the latte for free, but you pay for the space, right? So it's sort of the inverse, which is sort of true because we do provide lattes for most people uh, for free. Um, but, but the point became, it became interesting. And by having all those limitations, okay, we're able to provide exactly the opposite relief. Uh, and so effectively those two, uh, you know, became sort of this 1.5 by default, I would say. And, and now we're overly focused on launching it in London. And of course, all access is launched globally. Um, so we feel, and, and, and the last part I sit back and say is that we also pivoted, you know, we use ourselves as being a flexible office space provider, and we soon became a flexible space provider and the word flexibility actually came into our vocabulary right at the beginning of the pandemic. So right in March, we honed in on the word flexibility. Uh, and, you know, and I say that because today, uh, you know, we're doing, uh, you know, we just finished a large deal with NYU in both, uh, you know, Shanghai for their students to do online education and actually just finished a, them leasing an entire building in Greenwich Village uh, to serve as their study lounge area in, in between classes before they could go to restaurants and they could overcrowd crowd a library, which they can't do today. And where do these kids go in between classes? And, 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 and we've done that for them. Uh, so we've done, you know, with multiple universities, we've, we've actually finished deals with over hundred universities globally uh, to provide space for either lounges, access to studying, to create a collegial environment. Um, and so still so we pivoted uh, tremendously to the uh, flexible space environment, so. I don't know whether that would be considered 1.5 or not, but it's definitely evolved our way of thinking. We've launched a life sciences group just to focus on life sciences. And so we are pivoting effectively to different uses that we traditionally did. Ah, that's Car Caroline's favorite topic is life science. She, we're it's we're talking about having a panel topic. in life science. So might, might want to reach out to you on that. It's a very good, good way to go. Um, so, I know flexibility is so important to WeWork. It's a, it's a word that's used so often. And uh, I can't think of a better word uh, for what we needed in 2020 uh, in terms of the workplace. Um, so with, I don't think we could get away with doing one of these webinars without really talking about how you've set up the WeWork space uh, for people to feel comfortable coming back to the office. Um, flexibility is obviously very important. People can work from home. They can go to different offices. How have you set up uh, the office to make everyone comfortable to come back? So a couple of things, you know, during the early stage of the pandemic in April and May, we didn't know how long this would last, uh, but we did have the, you know, the, the benefit of knowledge from China, but we, we do have a lot of locations there. Uh, and obviously this started off in December uh, in China and by January uh, there was a shutdown. So we, and how do you bring people back? Um, so we decided to go ahead and use best practices to, you know, de-densify our locations, to increase uh, sanitization, to improve air circulation. Uh, and we really thought by, you know, June, July, or definitely by July 4th, people would start to return. And we wanted to make sure when they returned, you'd feel very comfortable in your environment. Um, and, and so if you came to any of our locations and you came to the common areas, it's very clear, you know, what social distancing really means. You'll see we've, I think, overdosed on sanitization equipment everywhere. So it's in your face. Uh, and of course, the untold truth is we've also changed all the HEPA filters uh, in, in our HVAC system. So people know, and obviously you keep the places really cold, 
because you're meant to increase circulation by keeping the air, air conditioning up, um, you know, during, during uh, so, so the circulation gets better. So I think when people come into the locations, people feel very comfortable. We did a survey of our members, and here's the most ironic part of the survey. 75% of the members who visited said they really enjoy coming back to work, and 75% of the people who never visited said they don't feel comfortable coming back to work. So they hadn't been to the environment, but it was just a mindset that this is, you know, you know going back to anyone's offices uh, is, it could be worse. Um, but quite honestly, you know, I've actually, you know, you know, good or bad, I'm in the office business and I didn't shelter in place for a single day. I went to a WeWork office every day. Uh, and I can only tell you that you talk to the people who come there and the small businesses that show up every day, and you ask them why they're there. And, you know, I'll give you, you know, my rate of reasons, everything from collecting my check to collecting my mail to getting peace of mind. Um, and so, and, and we kept all our 800 locations open through the entire pandemic. Um, so, so I think we are we're well prepared. If people come and see, they would, you know, have this great desire to come to work uh, because, you know, like it or not, we're not enjoying being home. Yeah, I think it depends on uh, everyone's home situation, how quick they are to come back to work. And I keep hearing more and more that people are ready to start heading back. So, hopefully, that's a positive thing. Um, you you mentioned your different um, geographic areas. So, I guess which obviously our the economy here in New York is hurting, America is hurting, and geographic and all around the world. So, where, which offices do you think are are best equipped to sort of bounce back first? Well, I think the I, I would actually sit back and say at least from a, a WeWork perspective, from, an, from a physical plan perspective, the entire world we are prepared to come back to work. Uh, now, uh, different places have reacted differently. China is back to work 100%, uh, leasing activities at all time highs. Uh, and no one's even thinking for a moment not coming to work is a solution. Uh, you know, you can, you can apply that the same to South Korea. So I would say the Southeast Asia, APAC region is either back to work 100% or near 100%. What I am fascinated by is places like you know France, like Paris is back 83%, Italy is back in the mid 70s, Germany is back in the mid 70s, um, and 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 the UK you know is now back about 35%, um, and of course Boris Johnson and the mayor of, uh, of of London have made no bones about you know people need to get back to work and the country can't make progress unless we get back to work with real leadership, um, and so you know effectively I would sit back and say. You know, even in the States, we're ready if you do it in a disciplined way and take real precaution. Uh, but really, the business leaders and I, you know, I watched a close friend, Jeff Lau, talk about people coming back to work and Bill Rudin and Scott Reckler. And they're absolutely right. We live in an ecosystem and we're not, you know, accepting our ecosystem. And it's the I versus the us. And it's a very sensitive topic. And I appreciate that. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, New York City is 9% of the U.S. GDP, and if you add San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Washington, D.C., we're 22% of the U.S. GDP. And so, uh, you know, I would say as much as for our sake of our children, uh, we need to be home. As for our sake of our children, we don't need more debt. So the ecosystem has to come back. And anyone who thinks you can work from home, then my only answer to that question is, then why are we in a great recession, almost a depression? So obviously it's not working. And I think Reed Hastings said it in the Wall Street Journal today uh, very well. If anything, I would have thought Netflix could work from home, okay? And if he could come out and say, it's not working, then I rest my case. <laughs> That's great. Um, so you mentioned, uh, you mentioned your, your friend, uh, Jeff Blau, and I've heard uh, you interviewed before about how you are uh, working with landlords uh, and negotiating leases. And you mentioned as part of your, your, your four prongs of, of bringing WeWork back, um, negotiating with landlords. And uh, so how is that? One of our members actually submitted a question ahead of time too about this. How are you working with the landlords? How do you pick which leases? What is the process like? So one thing, you know, big picture, I always wanted to do the right thing. Okay, I've been all my life, I've been a landlord on the other side. Uh, and I want to be very transparent in every negotiation. 
So we try to make uh, the locations for all EBITDA positive pre-COVID. We don't expect you know, the reaction of COVID should be the lever to force an issue. Uh, and there were situations where we did take assets you know, above market on a pre-COVID basis. So we've been very transparent. We share our entire numbers with our landlords. We share the entire EBITDA of the, of the location with our landlords. And we try to create win-win situations. You don't win every time or you don't lose every time. We try to do the right thing on both sides. And I think our transparency has really helped uh, in, in, in doing that. If we want to exit locations, uh, we are doing it by paying dollars. Uh, we're not, there's no threat. Uh, our financial condition is very stable. So, you know, there's nothing to threaten, you know, bankruptcy or the single purpose entity. We're not even going on that path. That's not in our vocabulary. We have a good balance sheet. We want to do a win-win situation. Uh, and, and, and so, and I always sort of sit back and say, it's either win-win or win -lo or lose-lose. Uh, I don't mind either one of those. I just don't like win-lose. Um, and so, so we've been very transparent. Uh, that we've exited over 50 buildings uh, and by paying real money. Uh, we've negotiated over 200 uh, deals. Uh, and I think, uh, and we have very few lawsuits uh, kind of ironic, most of our lawsuits are against our landlords who owe us tenant allowances. Uh, and, uh, and actually the irony is if you want me to take a location today, I'm demanding adequate assurance from the landlord that they're viable. It's the other way around. Uh, so it's very ironic to find ourselves in a situation where we've become a lender to the landlords. Uh, you know, they owe us about a half a billion dollars today in tenant allowances. So we've been you know, very, uh, and actually we've helped landlords. So, you know, they owe us money and they can't pay it. Uh, we've, we've given them a payment plan to pay us back, the, you know, or by deducting the rent. Um, so we've, you know, it all depends on the situation. We've tried to create predominantly win-win. And I think it's because we want to be transparent and we want to be the tenant of choice, uh, you, know, you know, as we see through the other side of the pandemic. Okay. Um you obviously had a ton of experience from rescuing GGP and, and all, everything you did at GGP, um, all the retail experience from Vernado and, and your role at Forest City. Um, how did all that, how did all that prepare you to take on this role? Like are, were, what lessons did you learn during your career up to this point that were, that are most important now? You know, I, you know, I don't know how to answer that question because I never really thought I was a turnaround person till someone hired me to do GGP. Uh, you know, having done a startup at Forest City, it helped, you know, resuscitate the retail portfolio at Vornado and then turn around uh, GGP. I never really thought of it. Uh, you know, I, I, I would sort of sit back and say, you know, maybe the things I believe in, uh, I think if you believe in the brand, you believe in the fundamentals, uh, you have, you know, uh, hopefully leadership abilities uh, and, and, and you can create a very simple plan for success. Uh, I'm a big believer of keep it simple, stupid. And if you can't keep it simple, stupid to show that the math works and the math doesn't work. Uh, and so, so to me, you know, uh, is, is you got to understand what your near term goals are and your long term goals are. And a lot of times people are looking at five years out and I'm very laser focused on 2020 and 2021. And I would sit back and say, you know, my GGP experience taught me that never think more than two years out and make sure that the first year you deliver what you say you're going to deliver. And, and, and so having a real plan uh, in place uh, and being able to execute on it, um, you know, uh, and, and having the confidence, I think, that you will see it to the other side of, of the tunnel with light. Uh, you know, I, I think that level of confidence, maybe foolheartedly, uh, makes you, you know, gives you the gives me the confidence that I can see it to the other end. Much to say I'm 58 years old and this is my last gig. I better not screw it up. Never never say it's your last one. You never know what's coming up. This is my last one, I assure you. <laughs> And they only remember you for your last one. They don't remember the one before. <laughs> um, 
with the the confidence you mentioned about having done this before, um, I would imagine the the culture within WeWork, right? You know, you came in. Um, how have you seen the culture change? And and I know we have a few members of YMWRA who who are at WeWork, and I've heard incredibly positive things. So I, I wonder, I wonder from your perspective what you see. So many years ago, I read a book called Winning Cultures, Winning Teams. It's by a guy called Larry Sen, and uh, I knew nothing about really what culture meant, even in its truest sense, because when you work for founders, you know, work for Bruce Ratner, it's Bruce's culture, you work for Steve Roth and Steve's culture, right? So, and you never think about it in, in, in different terms. And so when I took over GGP, I sort of sat back and said, so what is GGP's culture, right? Because it was, it had gone from a family run business to a profession, not to a professionally run business, but to a professional to run the business. Not that the family was running it unprofessionally, I might add. I've been questioned, when you know, I say that, so I want to clarify. Uh, and, and so I wanted to speak back and say what the culture should be. And reading this book, it was very, uh, you know, evident that culture plays a very big part. And this is now 2011, 2012, before culture became a buzzword, okay? And then we worked through what the core values were, who the core constituents were. And so interestingly now, WeWork had a culture, okay? That was what it was known for. And, 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 and so, you know, but if I sort of, you know, walk around and sit back and say, what is the culture, right? So it took us all getting together to really honing in on the core values, okay? And to make sure that we can hone in the core values and hone in on who our core constituents are. And my mantra has always been, if you can, you know, live by a core value and you can serve a core constituent every day, you, we will make money. Um, and so I think culture is, a, is, is part of the DNA of a family. Um, and so it's really, really important. And we've just started the journey, okay, uh, in my opinion. And the journey, one, one never ends, okay. Uh, and I'm happy to say that we now have core values and we're, you know, we're, we're starting the journey to build our family back together. There has been obviously a lot of uh, change within the organization and uh, the organization needs to, you know, obviously rebuild itself. And so very, very focused on uh, making sure that the culture is part of our DNA. Got it, interesting. Culture is very important. I think, especially from this work at home environment, it's hard to, it, it's harder for a company to build a culture. I know, uh, you know, when I have meetings with my team, you know, the, pe the younger uh, people that are just coming out of college, the ones that are on the Zoom in their bedroom, uh, their parents, you know, it, it's hard for them to be able to meet the people within the company in the same way as, as being in person. Um, so how do you, how do you, how do you uh, spend time with your team and, and make sure that they know that the right person's leading the group? Look, I think that's why this, the Zoom, I mean, if you think about this, right, you know, 80% uh, of the millennials and Gen Z actually sit back and say Zoom doesn't work, right? 50%, 60% actually sit back and say they don't want to be the Zoom generation. And what's really more important is, uh, you know, I spoke to the person and, and, and you, you can guess what the person is because I'm going to give it away in a second. And I said, by the way, you know, you know, person X, how do you lean in on a Zoom call? And she said, never thought of that. It's a real problem. And, and, and so, so trying to build a culture Okay, almost if you worked together before, maybe you got a chance. Okay, but if you've never worked together, you want too many people to dial into a Zoom call and too few people who actually say anything. Uh, and so, if you had, you know, so it's very hard to lean into a call. So, I think actually, you know, look, at the end of the day, we know of two things. One is for the first 90 days from the work from home, everyone thought, it works because productivity stayed up in their own in their minds, uh, and and now it's proven over the last thirty days productivity is down eleven percent, which probably means it's down twenty percent, and which probably means as the fall keeps going, it's going to get worse, right? Uh, because it's hard to do that, you know, in a disciplined way. And two, innovation and you know collaboration, which is seventy four is down seventy four percent. Two things that make up America, highest productivity per capita and the most innovative country in the world. And if we give up both of those, which the Zoom generation cannot allow us to do, Tim Cook said it the other day, 
I can't make an iPhone on my kitchen table. So, I mean, if these, these are the people who can do everything because they're the most highly technological people. So people like us who are not so technological, what are we going to do? Hopefully, hopefully our kids uh, at home are, hopefully my kids at home now are figuring that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have, a, I have a little bit of a personal question, uh, just in, in reading up and, uh, you know, you moved from India uh, here, I guess I read that you went from India and then you went to a school in England, a, a private school in England, and then you moved to Philadelphia. Um, how, how, was, how was that experience and, and, you know, how different, I guess, was that experience for you? Well, let me just talk about moving from India to America because that was very different, right? So I actually came from a family that was by Indian standards, middle to upper class. Uh, so I went to private school in India, live, you know, like, you know, I would say just about the same lifestyle I live today. It took me 35 years to get to my, the lifestyle my father gave me. I hope it doesn't take my son 35 years to get to his lifestyle that he's been living. But, but, but more importantly, I actually just, you know, I came to America because I didn't want to study in England and that sort of forced me exchange student uh, where you go live with multiple families and you go to public school. So for me, it was a rude awakening, you know, from going from having your own room, going to a private school, you know, with all your needs taken care of, then to share a bedroom uh, and live in a suburb of Philadelphia and go to public school and live with other people. And I actually think hindsight, it was fantastic because it made me more independent you know, made me fend for myself, made me respect others. Uh, and it was a humbling experience. And I've never forgotten that. And so, you know, being humble or having humility, you know, is a core value of who I aspire to be. I don't want to sit back and say that I'm there every day. And, and, and so, and I look at myself in the mirror and say, what if the clocks got turned back again? And so I actually think, you know, hindsight, my father did me a favor uh, by, 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 you know, not supporting my habit of coming to America and going to a private school here, uh, you know, uh, when I decided to abandon the private school in the UK. So, so I actually think that, you know, understanding humility, understanding how to, you know, to, to deal with people at all, all levels uh, has taught me a lot as I've lived my last, you know, 42 years in this country. So, yeah. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? Exactly correct. Um, so not just a whole company, because I know you've fixed entire companies and worked on these amazing deals, but do you have a favorite deal that you've worked on over the years? Uh, you know, mall you've acquired, some, some deal you've worked on that's your favorite that sticks out? I would have to say my first acquisition at Vornado. So I would say, you know, you know, Steve said, you gotta go buy something, come on, you know, do something, have some guts. You know, uh, and I absolutely had no guts, you know, and, uh, and plus, you know, those who know Steve, you know, he's incredibly bright, incredibly smart. And I bought a, uh, a, a building um, on um, Sixth Avenue, I'm going to think it's 11th Street. Uh, it was the old Dean and DeLuca's. I'm told, you guys are too young. You won't remember this, but anyway, uh, which now is Citarella. So, so uh, so I, so, I, so I bought this building, I'm making it up for $11 million. I'm thinking about that number, it was like a nothing number, but I sweated my day off. And then of course, now I'm panicked, you know, how do I lease it up, you know? And uh, because, you know, if I can't lease it, then, you know, then, I, then it was a dead loss. And I, at least that I can't remember, to Joe Guerrero, I, I'm making numbers up, $600,000 a year, something like that. You know, 5% return, which I thought was a horrible return, but nevertheless, but then the, the, uh, then I was so desperate to show a profit that essentially I sold it to Joe, I think of 15 million. And I thought, wow, I made four million bucks, that's a real good deal. And, and you know, Steve laughed at me the whole thing. He said, I would probably never have sold it. The rent keeps going up, you would, you would have been great. You know, I had a 20 year lease with 3% bumps a year. What was your issue? But I just panicked, um, you know, to show a profit. But, you know, I think that kind of thinking, you know, is, uh, is I, I, I remember all the time. So, you know, makes me, you know, I don't know whether I want to just dream in the future forever or whether I, 
you know, do the right thing to know that, you know, life is about making money, it's about making a profit, okay? Uh, or business is about making a profit, profit and profitable growth is not a bad thing, okay? It's a good thing. Uh, yeah. And so I think that taught me a lot. Interesting. Um, before we turn it over to some audience questions, uh, anything else that maybe I didn't cover that you want to mention about WeWork or anything? No, I'll uh, let the, you know, let's ask some more questions and uh, thank you so much. Okay. Caroline, you want to read the first audience question? Oh, sorry, having trouble unmuting. Um, yes, sure. So one question we wanted to ask, and it ties into um, what Leslie was speaking about in her invocation. Obviously, diversity is uh, a very important topic in all businesses, but especially in real estate right now. Is there anything WeWork is doing specifically uh, to foster diversity in, in the culture there? Yeah, so, you know, you know in the, we actually look at it a little differently. I mean, most people think about the diversity and inclusion. We use it as inclusion and diversity where it was a long debate because if you can't be inclusive, you can't be diverse. Uh, so, you know, so I think that's really one important. Uh, we have, you know, a person who's responsible for inclusion, inclusion and diversity. And as a matter of fact, one of the things is this company has always been inclusive uh, just because of its core nature. And, you know, it's actually ironic when you walk around and, 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 you, and you see, it is truly, you know, there is so much inclusion and diversity, uh, but we foster it now just to make sure we get it at the higher levels in the organization, which is where most companies fail at it. You know, they do very well at middle management and then it finds that it fails. And so obviously one of the things is to make sure that for every position you hire, you make sure there's a, you know, there's, there's diversity as part of the equation. Um, and so if you don't do that, it, you don't try hard enough. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, we do have, uh, you know, many groups here. One is a We for Color who participate with us, you know, all, all the time on what they would like to see. Uh, and they were very thoughtful on how to make this company better. And we've implemented almost all their thoughts. Uh, you know, there are a lot of research. And so we have an open dialogue uh, and the, you know, we truly have an open door policy. And one of the few things is more and more people, you know, don't feel, you know, constrained uh, to reach out to the upper levels of the organization. Uh, and when they do, we're, you know, incredibly responsible and responsive. So it's, it's distilled from, you know, from the leadership down. It can't start from the bottom up, has to start from the top down. Uh, and it's always been the case. And I did this at GGP as well. So, you know, again, it wasn't, it took a long time. It takes time. People want it to happen quickly, but it takes time. But as long as you are deliberate in a 12 to 24 month period, it's amazing what an impact you can have to an organization. All right. Thank you. Great. Hi, Sandy. Um, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, question, um, if you could go back and give any advice to your younger self, perhaps at Tornado or at Forest City, um, or maybe even before that, uh, what would you say? Uh, one is, you know, never think about money, okay? If you're thinking about career, don't confuse it, okay? Uh, two is, is don't be afraid to pivot, okay? You may not know it, uh, but if as long as you've got a good work ethic, uh, you know, you can do anything you want to do. Uh, and, and so, so don't be afraid to pivot. And I can tell you one of the few things in my career, I started working at the age of 20 and all the way through, I would till 1994, I'll say, I spent my entire life pivoting, okay? I designed, you know, nuclear power plants as a civil engineer. I, you know, went to did the big dig in Boston. You know, I was really an engineer. I got into the business designing shopping centers and all of a sudden, you're doing capital markets and you're doing leasing and doing asset management. And I continued pivoting and literally till the age of, I would sit back and say 32, I made the same amount of money virtually as I did from the age of 25. Right. And, and I never worried about, you know, that I only worried about what my career path would be and how do I become a more complete person if I wanted to do that. Now I had a different thought. I did it all 
because I thought I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Okay, so I wanted to learn all aspects of the business so that I could be an entrepreneur. I never got to be an entrepreneur, but I'm glad I pivoted often in my early stages. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question from the audience. Um, this one goes, do you prefer addressing the challenges of the office sector opposed to the retail sector at this time? And what's your uh, macro viewpoint on retail today? Uh, I love the office sector. <laughs> I, you know, I shouldn't say that, uh, you know, you know, all every job is difficult. Every you know, assignment is difficult. And, and today, by the way, the office sector is not easy. Uh, but I think we sit in a in a good space, in a flexible space. And, 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 and I say that we sit in a good space because at least we are a good option now for people who don't want to make long-term commitments uh, with ready-to-go space or with those who want to downsize but need an overflow capacity or those who want to de-densify in the short term in space. So, you know, I think we sit in a good spot, you know, again, time will tell. Um, so, I, so that's why I sort of sit back and say, um, you know, um, um, you know, I think sitting where I sit in this business, I, I think I'm better off than, than not. However, I'll go on to say that, you know, uh, we've always believed that the nation was over retailed. Okay. I, I'll never forget when I was with Bruce Stratner, we used to sell the boroughs of New York City and we would say US retail per capita, 19 square feet per person, the boroughs retail per capita, three square feet per person, let's go do something in the boroughs. And we built an entire business on that mantra. And then for years, uh, I can't remember the first time I said it, but it must have been 12, 2012, 2013, US you know, retail per capita was 24 square feet and high quality retail real estate per capita was four square feet per person. So kind of ironic, very similar numbers, kind of fascinating. And so I think if you, so there was always going to be a bifurcation and we've talked about that for as long as I was CEO of GTP. And, and we built a business on that model. Uh, and the bifurcation, I think just got, you know, divided faster, okay? Where the lower quality assets will be worse off faster and the high quality assets will actually be, will be just fine. Uh, and actually could actually do better, uh, you know, over time. And so I feel the same way that if you have the ability that you have high quality assets, okay, you know, you should be the beneficiary of this because pre-COVID, okay, 10% of all retail sales was online and 90% was in bricks and mortar. So even if that formula changed and becomes, is 20, 25% and 70, 75%, it's still gonna be a big portion that's bricks and mortar. So, so you know, and the other aspect is there's a graying of is it really e-commerce? Is it really bricks and mortar? If you buy online, pick up and store, what is it, right? So I think effectively there's gonna be a, you know, a, 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 a meeting of how they sort of work together. You need both to work together. But again, I go back to, if you are an owner of that four square feet of person of high core retail real estate, I think you're just fine. Thank you. Um, how does uh, WeWork distinguish itself from other uh, home gaming facilities? Um, some of which are uh, developers and landlords themselves. See, I, 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 for people who don't know me, I never say anything bad about anyone, okay? And I say this in a good way, okay? And I remember in the retail business, you know, I was friends with all my competitors and I really believe one thing, all tides rise together. So I want this concept, okay, to win. There's plenty of room for everyone, right? Today, I can't remember, but two or 3% of all office space is flex. And everyone, if you look at the most conservative people will tell you it should be about 10%, right? So effectively, okay, you want all ties to rise. We want all our, all the people in our business to do well. And the only differentiator I would sort of sit back and say that we have, okay, you know, that, you know, is our global scale and footprint, right? So if I was to give an all access pass to someone who's my member, okay, effectively you can go to 800 locations. 
very few companies can do that because they don't have that sort of global scale and footprint. Leaving aside that, there's plenty of room for all of us to do well. Okay. So one person asked a question about, uh, you mentioned the 80-20. Uh, what are the characteristics of the 20? Could be multiple factors, okay? The first thing I start off with is, is it in the right location, okay? Second is, is it priced correctly? Can I ever make money? If I'm never gonna make money, okay, and even if it's in the right location, then either we have to do something to correct it, because that would be the right place to go, which is to correct the economics so that we can all make money, okay? But it's always location and then price. When I say price means I have to be EBITDA positive. Okay. Uh, one other one was uh, a number of years ago, uh, long before you were uh, steering the ship of WeWork, um, an executive told a conference of land that uh, told a conference that landlords are WeWork strategic partners. So, with the influx of direct of developers into co-working and flexible office space, do you still think that is true? arguably that you may never have thought that was true, but that was something someone must said before. Uh, I 100% think that they still are partners. I 100% am doing the right thing because I want them to think of us as the, you know, as the, uh, as the flexible office, pay, pay, office place provider of choice. And if we do all the right things, even if they do have the same concept as us, I'm hoping that they will see the merit in us either operating it for them. They will see the merit of our global footprint to want to be part of our all access product. They will see the merit of us being in the back. Uh, you know, you, you know, think about, again, I don't want to compare myself, but if you think, which I'm not comparing, but I'll just give you the, the thesis. You know, Amazon started off by doing a first party seller. Okay, then they became a third party seller of goods and they came up with AWS and AWS's origins was to support their infrastructure, right? So it's a great model on how they pivoted to see what happens. So if we do our job correctly and we, and, and we are, and, and, and we become, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the person of choice, there are many things that we can do with them. Uh, it doesn't really have to have a WeWork name uh, on, on the door for us to be a partner of them to run their back office systems and run their system. And we have, a, you know, so if you ask me, I still view that, but I'm going to say, okay, our biggest, you know, uh, partners of choice today are our, is the brokerage community. Okay, they're our lifeline because honestly, it's all about lease, lease, lease. That's the name of the game. Okay. One last question before we go, because uh, it's very timely with what you started out with. So how do you manage uh, COVID concerns with the university deals that you mentioned this morning? Are there additional uh, things you need to do in terms of the university for the schooling for the, the kids? Well, I think, you know, the, well, you know, a few things, right? So we actually sent a questionnaire out to everyone who wants to come into the space and you have to answer that questionnaire to depending on the scale of the building, you know, you know, if it is, if we have the ability, we will check the temperature. If you come into our building and in New York, you know, there's an automatic, you know, temperature checking machine. I happened to be in Boston all of last week and almost every landlord had done that. So I was very happy about that, by the way, uh, that they didn't implement that. Um, and, 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 and the other aspect is when you come in, it's all de-densified, right? So you show that ability. So the ability to really congregate, okay, is vastly minimized, which is why the universities, one, are doing that. And, and two, the reason we become a choice is there's someone to monitor it, right? So, uh, so it's, a, it's a hard job policing it, but our job is to do the best we can to police it. Uh, mass are required within our spaces if you are congregating in the common area. Uh, if you're in your own office, it's not required. But um, so there are things that we are you know, doing and, and we're dealing with smaller scale of people in a controlled environment, right? It's unlike going to a football game or going to someone's home, or might I even say going to a bar. 
Great. Well, thank you so much, Sandeep. This has been so informative. We're a great honor to have you here today and just want to give a big thank you for your time and we really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Laura. Thanks for doing that and administering. I'm glad you're in your office. I hope your kids are doing well at home. <laughs> thank you. All right. Stay well. Thank you.